In this video, I'm going to talk about PDK errors and faults that have become apparent over the last couple of years that the Porsche documentation points you down the wrong path. So what I'm going to clear up is uh, some information that's come to hand after I've sort of helped a whole bunch of people and uh, workshops over the last year or so diagnose faults with their transmissions. So clearly this video isn't really for general consumption, it's for people who are trying to diagnose problems or maybe for people who just want to geek out on this stuff. The first error that I want to talk about is where you get an error for a gear selection or gear deselection. So it's locked in gear and it can't come out uh, or it's tried to select a gear and it hasn't been fully selected. Uh, the flow charts that Porsche provide and the error codes point you down the path of either changing the valve body or it says this is the transmission failure, which means there's a mechanical fault with the gears down the back. The chances of that stuff happening is really, really low. And as it turns out, a lot of the time it's actually a distance sensor problem. So what I'll do is I'll have a quick look at the transmission. We'll fit this and I'll show you exactly what's going on. Then we'll have a discussion about how the sensor works and how the TCU interprets the data that comes from this thing and how that can be ambiguous uh, and then how we're actually going to test this to see if this is actually the problem or not which it most likely is. Here's where the distance sensor sits inside the transmission. There are four shift rods, one, two, three and four is on the other side for the separate distance sensor channels, one, two, three and four. Obviously distance sensors one, two and three point out in this direction because it's detecting the magnets here and four points out the other side to detect the magnets on shift rod four. Shift rods two and three stick out the back here because that's where these gears are. One and four, the gears are up the front here and you can't see those at the moment, but the concept is obviously exactly the same. We've got the magnet here on the shift rod and the distance sensor is going to detect the position of that magnet relative to the distance sensor and check that against the tables from the calibration to check that the gear has been either selected or deselected correctly. So for example, if I was going to select first here, which is this thing going forward, I just push that forward there, the shift rod moves about you know, eight and a half millimetres or so, which in turn moves the magnet that far, it, and then the distance sensor detects that. And obviously when we deselect the gear, it's again going to check that it's been deselected and it's back to that central position prior to going and doing something else in the gearbox. This all happens super quickly, but obviously this sensor being able to detect accurately exactly what gear selection has occurred is a really important part of gearbox operation. Here's a basic diagram of a distance sensor. Uh, what I've done here is basically to pick if I got the distance sensor and just sliced it straight through. I'm just looking at one of the channels here with a magnet moving over the top here. That's what the magnet is here. On the inside you have a detection coil as well as a bunch of electronics. Uh, the input to this is a 5 volt DC uh, input and the output is a square wave pulse width modulated uh, signal which is then interpreted by the TCU uh, to tell the position of the the shift rod in a central position where no gear is selected, it is going to give about a 50% return. When we select the gear in one direction, which is about an eight and a half millimeter movement to fully select it, uh, it's going to give an 80% return or about that uh, in one direction and a 20% return in the other. And when you do a calibration, when the transmission was first installed in the car and it came out of the factory, or you've consequently done a calibration, what it's doing is it's going to run through all of the gears for all the different channels and check the numbers that it gets back for all the duty factors. And then it's going to reference those every single time it either selects a gear or deselects a gear to check that the gears are in the correct position before it then goes and applies clutch pressure. The response from the sensor, like I talked about, we should get about a 20 or 80% return if it's selected correctly. But if I continue to move the magnet beyond that, once it gets to about a 10 or 90% position, it doesn't actually change the duty factor. So I can have the magnet out there. And once it hits about 10%, it just stays at 10% as long as it's detecting a magnet. And in this direction here, once it gets to 90%, if you keep on pushing the magnet beyond it, it uh, won't give you anything higher than a 90% return. The only time you get more than a 90% return is if there is no magnet detected at all, and then it immediately gives you a 95% return, or if there is no return at all, it just gives you a 0% return. 
So the way the TCU interprets the data that's coming back from this is if it gets a duty factor return of between 10 and 90%, it considers that perfectly valid. It's only when it gets out of between 10 and 90% that it flags that as a distant sense of failure uh, because it has now determined that either it can't detect a, a magnet at all or there is nothing coming from it at all, so it gives a 0% return. Uh, but if it's within 10 or 90%, it considers that perfectly valid. The problem we have is that sometimes these things can fail where the duty factor return remains between 10 and 90%, uh, but it is incorrect. So for example, I might select the gear correctly and I'm expecting to see an 80% return, but it gives a 65% return. It actually interprets that as the shift rod hasn't moved enough. It actually hasn't fully selected. Clearly it can't go any further because it's fully selected the gear. So it interprets that as a, a gear selection problem. And so it flags that as a, uh, a gear selection code and not a distance sensor code. And then, you know, if you go through the, the documents, it actually says, well, we need to change the valve body or the transmission when in fact it's the distance sensor the problem. Uh, by the same logic, sometimes when it's in the central position, instead of giving that 50% return that it was expecting to see, it's actually going to give something that's different to that. So it then interprets that as a gear deselection issue. And again, that will go down the path of you know, telling you to change the valve body of the transmission when in fact it's the distance sensor is uh, the issue. So to test this, what we're going to do is set it up with a five volt power supply and be looking at the duty factor return of a magnet that's we can just move uh, back and forth across it and check that we get about a 50% return from a central position and that when we move it to the end, uh, it doesn't go beyond 10% in this direction and doesn't go beyond 90% in that direction. And when we remove the magnet completely, uh, we get a 95% return. That is what a good sensor looks like. If you're not getting that, then it's most likely the distance sensor that's the problem. So this is my setup to test the distance sensor. I've got a five volt supply. You could use a power supply. Uh, I find it more convenient just to use four 1.25 uh, volt batteries in series and a little battery pack. Um, and connections to the plug itself. There are the three wires going to the speed sensor, obviously you're going to disregard those. There's a six that are going to the distance sensor itself. Red is the five volt supply, black is the ground, and all of the colored wires are the individual uh, sensor outputs, which is what the TCU is going to interpret. So the red and black power supply wires are going to the red and black here, and I've got a third wire, which is the one that's detecting, currently set up to distance sensor channel one and the ground for the uh, sensor is exactly the same ground as for the battery. Uh, as you can see here, I've got a magnet. I find it better if I just have a little bit of timber. I'm just using a pop stick here to move it back and forth. If it's sitting on the sensor itself, it tends not to work so well. Uh, and in the central position there, you can see it's giving me about a 50% duty factor return. Of note, if I change that to the frequency, between the different channels, it alternates between about a little bit over a thousand, which you can see there, to about 850 hertz. Uh, that's perfectly normal, so don't think that's an error. Uh, it's the duty factor that's important. As you can see, if I move that back and forth, I'm going to get the changing duty factor due to the change in uh, movement of the magnet. What's important when you're testing here to understand is that sensors one, two, and four are orientated in one direction. And sensor three, because of the, I think it was just a packaging thing, is flipped around. It, so it actually works in a reverse orientation. So for example, with distance sensor one, if I push that, that direction there, you can see it's decreasing the, the duty factor. If I were to do that on channel three, it would be increasing the duty factor. Also, the actual central position where it gives 50%, and this gearbox is set up for, for all of this, is not perfectly central on the sensor itself. So you can see my 50% return is actually, it's offset about a millimeter half in that direction. So sensors one, two, and four, the central position is offset in that one direction. Sensor three, because it's been flipped around, is offset in the other direction. So, so once I find my 50% position, you don't have to be super accurate with this. It's, it's normally pretty obvious if things aren't right. So what I want to be able to do is find that 50% position. And I'm going to move it about what I think is about eight mils and see if I get about a you know, change to about 80% in one direction and a change to about 
you know, 20 percent in the other direction. You can put marks here on the center if you want to check that as you know, if you want to be a bit more accurate, but generally you don't need to be too accurate. You can also see if I continue to push that beyond where it gets to about, you know, that 10%, keep on pushing it, it doesn't get any further, okay, it stays at 10%, and if I move it in this direction here, once it gets to about 90%, it doesn't change. But if I take the magnet away completely, it gives me a 95% return. So um, that is what you want to be looking for. That is the normal response from a good sensor and you're going to check each of those channels obviously you're going to flip it over for channel four and test on this side there's a basic test that you can do uh, without even pulling the distance sensor out of the car using PWIS like I've done here I've gone to the transmission control unit gone to actual values and input signals then go to the general tab and then I've brought up the four distance sensor uh, outputs at the moment the car's not going so it's in park and first is going to be selected or if it's an older car like a 987 or 997 uh, reverse will be selected which will show up as a negative about seven and a half millimeters on distance sensor four so you can check these here and of note you can then start the car and run it through a few gears which will give you a bit of an indication if things are okay so for example if you select neutral everything gets driven to a central value so you should see about zero for all of them within about a millimeter is perfectly acceptable i've had these uh, before where one might show at about three millimeters at the central position which was the indication that the distance sensor was going out uh, they replace that distance sensor and then immediately uh, it fixed the problem even, even though a distance sensor error hadn't been flagged and it was giving a gear deselection problem. Uh, so if we go and select neutral, all will be zero. If I select first, it'll actually select first like you've seen here, but on distance sensor four, it'll pre-select second. So that'll come up as about a positive seven and a half millimeter. And if then I go and select reverse, all of these will be zero, and this will come up as about a minus seven and a half millimeters. So that checks you know, pretty well distance sensor three and four. It does a bit of a check of distance sensor one and two. Now, if you wanted to put the, the car up and try and run it through all of the gears in a rolling test mode, then you can go ahead and do that. Uh, but uh, that's entirely up to you. But oftentimes, the indications are really basic tests like this will show you if you've got the distance sensor that's failing. So what I'll do is I'll start the car, I'll run through uh, neutral, reverse, and uh, drive, and we'll see the indications that we get here. Selecting reverse, Neutral, drive, and park. Another error that we see a bit of, which is actually a distance sensor problem, is where it drags the five volt supply uh, down and it gives you an error for the 5 volt supply power uh, being low which will make you think that that's a transmission control unit problem but it's actually a short or a problem with the electrics inside the distance sensor itself so the best way to test this which is really simple is in PWIS here just go to the transmission control unit actual values and input signals go to power supply go to the 5 volt power supply which is that one there and we're just going to look at that and you can see at the moment that's about 4.96 volts which is perfectly acceptable you'll get the error if it gets below about 4.5 volts and what you need to do and i'll show you how to do this in a moment just get under the back left of the car uh, if it's a boxster or cayman but on a, a 911 you have to lift the car uh, to get access to the plug and you're just going to disconnect the plug which is the one that goes to the speed sensor and the distance sensor and if the fault is within the distance sensor, the moment uh, you disconnect it, you will get that jump up to the correct voltage. And the moment you connect it again, it'll drag it back down to that low voltage. So you'll know that the, the distance sensor is at fault. Now, once you do that, you'll obviously have a whole bunch of codes, etc., that you'll need to reset, which is all fine. Uh, but that's the test that you need to do to check that it's the distance sensor that's dragging the five volt supply down. So the plug you're looking for to disconnect is this one back here. I'm just lying on the on the ground under the back left of the car so if you just get that tab there and just rotate that up and then just push that forward and that will just come off and then you can go to the to PWIS and see what that's actually done and obviously you're going to reconnect that later on uh, and then clear all the codes 
The last failure I wanted to talk about was an intermittent speed sensor problem. If this hard fails, it's going to give you a code for that, which would be great. But sometimes these can fail uh, intermittently. And the problem with that is that it doesn't flag it as a speed sensor problem. It flags it as a gear ratio monitoring problem, which normally indicates there's some sort of clutch pressure or clutch pack itself issue. When in fact, the error is with this. And the way to... Uh, detect this is to connect PWIS, put the car up in the air so the rear wheels can turn, start the engine, and we're going to run it in first gear. And what that does is in first gear uh, on shaft one, first is going to be selected. So with that clutch fully closed, that shaft will turn at engine RPM, but also second is pre-selected. And because the rear wheels are turning, that's actually going to drive shaft two at the ratio appropriate for gear two. So even though clutch two isn't engaged, you'll actually see a constant RPM from shaft two as well. So what you should see is if idle RPM is about 700 RPM, you'll see shaft one turn at about 700 RPM, you'll see shaft two turn at about 400 RPM, and it'll just remain constant the whole time you're logging it. And you'll probably do that for a long time to allow the car to fully warm up, allow the gearbox to get to full operating temperature. And if it's going to fail due temperature, then that's going to show up as an aberration in one of those two outputs from the speed sensor. So to do this test of the speed sensor, I'm going to lift the car off the ground. So I'm going to put it in the gear and have the, the car run. I'm just going to put it in the first. Uh, so in first, it'll have second pre-selected, so I can check both of the speed sensors at the one time. I don't need to use rolling test mode because this works fine if it's in first gear and you don't need to run it through all the gears. So I'm going to go to actual values and input signals, input shaft one and two actual values. There are those two values there. You can see that shaft one, it's locked because it's in park at the moment and that means that first gear is selected and because the rear wheels aren't moving, that means there's going to be no turning of the, uh, of the clutch itself. Whereas because nothing is selected on input shaft two, then that clutch can just freewheel with a little bit of drag that's inside the clutch pack. So to log this, I'm just going to click, hit both of those, hit data logger. I'm going to use individual diagrams. I just find that's easier. And now we'll start that. You can see input shaft one is at zero and input shaft two is uh, logging the value. When I put it into manual and first and let the back wheels turn and I'm just gonna let it sit there for ages and just monitor what the outputs from the speed sensors are. Uh, what I'm looking to see is that speed sensor one gives an indication of engine RPM and basically doesn't change from that. Input shaft two should give an indication of about 400 RPM. and the uh, something I'll note here, you can see it just sort of stops by itself sometimes. In fact, in the background, it's still logging it. So if you hit start, it'll just continue on where it left off. Um, so don't be alarmed by that looking like it's stopping. It, it actually continues to log in the background and you can go back and have a look at it later on. So what I'll do is I will go and select first in manual and then I'm just going to let the back wheels run and we'll just watch what happens. So releasing the brake there. Now, let's start that again to see where it's popped up to. You can see the input shaft one has now jumped up to engine RPM, about 700 RPM. Input shaft two is at about 400, which is the appropriate gear ratio for that. And that's just going to sit there like that. And if I see a jump, maybe down to zero or just a real aberration in one of those outputs, uh, that might be the cause of my problem. Uh, and you would need to replace the speed sensor.